excited to tell you all about what we do and all that good stuff tonight. So we're going to just jump right in. Where did Tina go? She's right here. <laughs> we're putting up the sign so we can keep the door shut. Okay. Um, I did want to give a special thank you to Tina. Tina is the, the bones that pulls the program together, and she does a phenomenal job with it. So we really appreciate all that she's done. Thank you. So we're going to start out with just a little bit of history. Um, the, the municipal clerk is the oldest of public servants in local government, government along with the tax collector. And in modern Hebrew translation of town clerk is Mezkir Hayir, it means reminder. Um, and the early keepers of archives were often called remembrancers. Remembrancers. You know what I mean. <laughs> Before the written record, their uh, memory served as the public record. And we're very glad that we have written records now because I think all the people in my memory would be in deep trouble. <laughs> and there is a handout in your packet that talks about the history of the clerk's position and goes back many, many, many years. And it's kind of interesting if you ever have the opportunity to um, look at it. And in ancient Greece, um, one of the first duties of the clerk was to decree a curse upon anyone who should seek to, de who should seek to deceive the public. And I always find that kind of interesting. <laughs> in the colonial development, um, the first settlers were in Plymouth, Mass, and they were appointed a person to record vital records, appointments, deeds, meetings, and the election of town officers. And in the middle of the 17th century is when the title town clerk appeared. Does anybody know what year Lebanon was incorporated as a town? Absolutely. And how about where the first settlers of Lebanon came from? Connecticut. Connecticut. Bingo. Got it. <laughs> and the town was chartered in 1761. You have a copy of the original town charter in your packet. It's a little bit hard to read. We actually have the original. And uh, we'll look up here that you're welcome to. We'll take a break to take a look at. Seminary Hill School, 
and um, with the school district consolidation of the elementary schools, obviously this, this building is no longer used as a school, but as the SAU offices. And next to the Seminary Hill School is the Dana House. The Dana House is also referred to as the Hall Cody House, and it was built around 1756, and it's a good example of the 18th century cape, which has undergone minimal alterations over the past 200 years. It's the oldest existing house in Lebanon and was the pioneer home of the Dana family, who were among the earliest settlers of Lebanon. It was originally located on South Main Street in West Lebanon, and it was purchased by the city in 1987 in its present location, and so that it would be preserved. And then the other map we have up there, it's called the Bird's Eye View Map, and it's from 1884. It's basically a lithograph-type map. Um, it's drawn as if an artist were in a hot air balloon looking down, which they often were, and or they climbed up a water tower or something like that. This one looks as if the person was standing on Storrs Hill, so it has that angle from it. It obviously is in really delicate condition. We do have some reprints and stuff of it, but that shows you um, an original one from a long time ago. Come on in. <laughs> So those are just some, some maps. And now back to the many faces of City Hall. These are um, some, the one, the old meeting house, which was built in 1792, and that picture, as it shows, was uh, taken in the 1960s. And then when that one was destroyed, um, a new one was built. And Oh, it just shows the decorations from the Centennial Patriotic Celebration is what that's all about. And then they got a Victorian style facelift, modernized it with ga gas fixtures. And that picture was in 1893. And then the current city hall, which was built in 1924 after the fire in Lebanon, which most people know about. And now I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights about our staff. And each, each of our staff members, um, just our very basic training is a, a course with the uh, DMV to be able to register vehicles and go through their training. But the bulk of our training is in-house. It takes a full year to learn the basics of our positions. And you'll understand that pretty soon as we go through what we, our responsibilities are. Um, Kristen and I attend conferences to help keep us informed and networking. Um, we go to a regional meeting, which is just a one-day meeting locally. We go to a state meeting, which is usually a three-day, and then we go to a um, New England three-day meeting, because the dates and stuff. And there are several different certifications and professional development programs that we've enrolled in and completed. There's me. Um, I've been with the city for 29 years. I started with the city manager's office in 1990, and moved into the position of city clerk in 2003 when the long-term uh, city clerk at that time, Dottie Doyle, retired. I have my New Hampshire certification. My, I'm a certified municipal clerk, which is a three-year program through the New England Association, and I'm currently working on my master's certification through the international cert clerk certification. Sorry. She's a phenomenal deputy. Oh, she's done her New Hampshire certification. Um, she's gone through the New Hampshire Public Cer Certified Public Supervisor Program through the State Bureau of Education. And as of today, she is now a certified municipal clerk. She got notified today that yep. she's got her wow. certificate there. <laughs> 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 uh, Lori Gould is an assistant. She's been with us for 12 years. She's gone through the New Hampshire certification program and she is gonna be attending the New England certification program to earn her CMC, which will take her three years to do. So she'll be doing that this summer. Darlene has been with the city for five years. Previously, she came from the town of Hanover and she was there for 10 years. So she brought some great education and skills with her. Um, she has just completed this last year, their New Hampshire certification class. And Jill Potlin. We recently grabbed Jill from the city of Claremont when we had an opening in our office. So she's been with us for six months. And she had prior six years prior experience in Claremont. And she's going to be getting the New Hampshire certification process this summer, this August. Our services. 
One of the ser or some of the services that we'll be focusing on tonight, records management and preservation, vital records, motor vehicle registrations, dog licenses, and elections. Does anybody know what other services our department handles for the city? Karen, you must. No. <laughs> well, here's some more. Um, we swear in elected officials. We administer oaths of offices for appointed board members um, and manage reporting secretaries for minutes and stuff with the boards and committees. We sell landfill tickets. We file wetland applications, cemetery deeds, notary public, and of course, voter registration, absentee ballots. So we're a busy group. We love being busy. And some of the other services, on, we're just focusing on these new online services that just became available within the past year. You can do your dog license renewals online. Vital records requests can be done online. And um, we have a registration estimator. So if you're sitting in a dealership and you're calling us and we can't get to the phone and you want to know what it's going to cost you to if you buy this car, what it's going to cost to register, you just go online, plug in your information, boom, there you go, you get an estimate out of that. So that's been very helpful to people. And we, of course, still do um, motor vehicle renewals online. A little bit about records management and preservation. Permanent records. These are a list of some of the permanent records that can never be destroyed. Obviously, important vital records, meeting minutes, town charter, and those types of documents. And you can see a picture of the vault, which you'll get a tour of later, a little glimpse of the vault there, that we store all of these records. And just to focus on the importance of it, the fire in 1923 that destroyed City Hall, as you can see, the vault remained, and those records were in that vault. So because of the preservation and the security of those records, we still have them today, because they're irreplaceable records, or one of a kind. And just to reinforce the importance of protecting the records, I don't know if anybody knows, but in May of 2000 and 2001, um, we had a flood here in City Hall. We had a broken water main outside of this building, and we had 260,000 gallons of water come through the building and do an incredible amount of damage. There's pictures over there, flood pictures. Um, they're rather interesting to, to look at, so you get a chance to take a peek at those. So the city continues to develop our um, records program to ensure the protect protection, they're cataloged and preserved. Um, many records have been conserved using the moose grant plates. Does anybody have a moose plate here on their vehicle? Good job. Well, the money that, some of the money from you purchasing those plates every year and the fees that you pay goes towards these type of programs to preserve documents. And I'll show you a picture. There's a before and after. And it costs one to $2,000 per book to go through the conservation process. The cities over the years, we've been awarded a little over $25,000 in grant funding, which we had to apply for and we were awarded. So we've gotten a lot of books conserved for that. And we are currently in the process of coming up to date with a digital records management system. Um, several reasons for that, reducing the city's dependence on paper and for storage capabilities and making it easier for the public to access. So when we implement this program, there will be a public-facing function where um, you'll be able to go into the system and look at records and stuff like that. So make it much easier. You won't have to come to City Hall and give me a list of what you need. I call you when it's ready. So it'll make, it'll make it great for everybody. And timeline for that, our, what we have, we put out a bid. We're reviewing applications, having done applications, um, proposals. and. Um, getting ready to select one of the vendors that submitted a proposal. So this is shows you the timeline of what we're hoping to get done. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen and give my voice a rest. Do you guys know what vital records are? Can you give me some examples of what might be a vital record? Yep. Any other marriage. ones? Yeah, marriage. Yes. Yeah, death, death, exactly. So we're the keepers of all of the uh, vital records for the city of Lebanon. Um, we started keeping records when we were established in 1761. Um, our job is a very important job. These are vital records because they are vital documents. They are legal documents of your major life events, being born, getting married, um, dying, as sad as that is to say, but that, that is an important event. And so because of that, we uh, really strive to maintain the accuracy of our records as well as the confidentiality. So our roles in vital records, we issue marriage licenses to anyone who wishes to get married in the state of New Hampshire. 
Um, we issue certified copies of vital records. A certified copy is a legal document. You need a certified copy of your birth record, for example, to go get your driver's license or to get a passport. Um, we also record changes to your records. So some of those changes can be adoption. So when someone's adopted and they were born in Lebanon, we have to go in and actually amend that record to reflect the adoption. We do legal name changes. Um, we get court orders sometimes to add fathers to records um, for birth records. And then there's just straight up corrections that we make. Um, the people who are inputting these um, records, they're human, they make mistakes and corrections often have to be made. So if you need a correction made to a record from Lebanon, you're gonna come in and see me or our staff. Um, and, and all of our functions with vital records are done in accordance with various state laws. We answer directly to the Division of Vital Records and Statistics, which is part of the Secretary of State's office for the state of New Hampshire. So our vault starts again at 1761 with paper records, and the picture that you see on that slide there, the very top one, it's hard to read, is the first birth that we have recorded in Lebanon. It's for Hannah Griswold. I'm not sure if she is related to Clark W. Griswold or not, but <laughs> she was born here. Um, in 2001, vital records started being filed electronically with the state. So there are actually no paper copies of birth records anymore beginning with 2001. Um, but they still file paper copies of death records and marriage certificates. And we're able to gain access to all of these records using a database known as Network. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Are the pre-2000, have the pre-2001 records also been filed electronically? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, gonna... it's everything. Exactly, yeah. So and that's actually a good point to bring up because these are a list of all the records that we can access statewide. So regardless of where you were born, as far back as 1935, as long as it was in New Hampshire, we're going to have access to that record electronically. The exception for births is 1949 and 1950, and the reason for that is when the state went through and they converted all their data, they hired an outside company to scan all their documents and then they did data entry. So whoever was in charge of these records in 1949 and 1950 thought it would be a really good idea to hard bind the records instead of putting them loosely bound so that they could be taken out of books. So they couldn't just throw them through a scanner. So those are being keyed on manually right now by the state of New Hampshire. And it's gonna take a few years. So sometimes we can gain access to them, sometimes we can't, but they, they will be in there eventually. We can go as far back as 1965 for death, 1960 for marriage. We do have access to some divorce records. All it is is just a one page document that shows that you're divorced. And we can go back to 1979, but we can only come up to within six months to the present. It does take them a little while to enter them in there. Um, civil unions, before same gender marriages were um, legal in our state, there were civil unions from 2008 to 2009. Um, beginning, I think it was January 1st, 2010, anyone who had not dissolved their civil union, their civil union was automatically made into a marriage record. But we can still access the ones that, that maybe didn't get converted because it ended. And then we can access dissolutions, which is um, the breakup of a civil union. And so does anyone think that vital records are open to the public? No? Okay. You're right. So in general, they're not open to the public. Um, some states, they are open records. I believe the state of Vermont, you can get anyone's record. Um, in New Hampshire, you cannot. Your records are protected. Um, if, if you are not directly related, but you need a copy of a record, you have to provide what's called tangible proof of interest in the record. Um, a lot of times that can be like, for example, a death certificate. If you owned a home with somebody, you were not married to them, you can produce a document that shows you require that death record to get that name taken off the deed, we can then issue you a copy. Um, and then certain records are open to the public. So for birth, we can do over 100 years, so 1918 and back is open to the public. And for death and marriages, it's 50 years. And so we can go as far back as 1968, uh, or excuse me, 1968 and back. And just a little plug, that's my grandparents' wedding picture. We have to personalize you. Yeah, we have to get a little personal here. Um, so just to give you an idea of what our volume is of records that we issue, we issue over 5,000 certified copies of records. And we did 105 marriage, marriage licenses in 2018. Um, and we- I way of you guys mm -hmm. seeing this? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> And we collected over $34,000 in revenue, and that's just for the cost of certified copies and the marriage licenses. So we do collect a fee when we're amending records. It's $10 to amend a record. That's not reflected in there. I actually don't have a number for that. 
um, and then statewide statistics. So you guys have a slide, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this one, um, but one of my favorite stats that I like to share all the time is the heaviest newborn, because 12.37 pounds is a whole lot of baby. <laughs> That's always a fun fact. And my other favorite thing about this stat is that the guy at the state that gave me these records felt the need to tell me that it was non-cesarean. <laughs> I was like, thank you for that image. Um, but on a more serious note, one of the things that I want to point out, um, so the Division of Vital Records, it began basically in the 1860s. So all the clerks were keeping copies of records um, since they were founded. So I think it goes back to like the mid 1650s, like right around 1655, I think, is when our first town had some records that they were filing. Um, somewhere along the line, the Secretary of State's office stepped in. This was somewhere in the 1860s, and they took over the vital records and they wanted um, the towns to give them copies. There wasn't a lot of follow through on that, so there were some, some records given and some weren't. And in 1905, uh, they finally stepped up and said, okay, we're going to create a division of vital records and statistics. And so now, any time a record was filed with the clerk's office, they automatically got a copy. So the Division of Vital Records and Statistics has been around for 114 years. And I just want to point out to you, if you look at the number of deaths that were filed um, in our state, and then the number of total births that were filed in our state, this is the second year where deaths have actually gone past the amount of births that are happening in our state. And when we go to our conferences, they give us a lot of these updates, and they're attributing this to the opioid crisis just to put that in perspective for everybody. Do we have any questions on vital records before I move on? No? Okay. So we're going to jump into motor vehicles. Does anyone want to take a guess at how many vehicles we register here? Don't be shy. Throw a number out. Anybody? No? We do over 14,000 vehicles every year. And vehicles include your passenger cars, pickups, trucks, trailers, motorcycles, anything that you can put a license plate on, we're including in vehicles. Um, so just the basics, if you own a vehicle or if you're financing it, your registration goes through your birth month. If you're leasing a vehicle or you have a business and you're putting the vehicle into a business name or a trust name for those of you who have trusts, the registration um, goes through a month that has been assigned to your um, business or trust or your leasing company's name based on the letter of the alphabet that they start with. So for example, if you lease a Toyota, you're gonna register your vehicle every year in the month of November because that's the month Toyota has been assigned to. Um, first time registrations are always prorated. We cannot issue a registration that goes less than five months or more than 16 months. And anytime you do a renewal, it's always done at 12 months. So even if you come in and you've got like one day left before the next year starts, you're gonna pay for the whole previous year. So um, it, it's not never prorated for a renewal. How early can you do it? You can do it up to four months in advance. And you count the month that you're in. All right. So um, it's like uh, inspections. Yeah, exactly, your inspections. And I think you can do your driver's license also up to four months in advance. Um, so the way we do our city fees, the calculation is based on what the MSRP is. The MSRP is the manufacturer suggested real, retail price of a vehicle and then it's taxed based upon its age. So a vehicle that's brand new, so a 2019 right now is going to be at the highest tax rate, whereas if you have like a 2003, it's going to be at the lowest tax rate. You pay each rate of tax for a full 12 months before the rate drops. Um, the fee is referred to as a personal property tax and it is actually um, tax deductible if you itemize deductions on your income tax. And then there's a few other small administrative fees that we collect. So this is just an example of the property tax. It's also known as millage, which basically means a certain amount of 1,000. So uh, 2019, um, currently it's 1.8% of the MSRP, or roughly $18 per thousand. And you can see, um, the vehicle ages. So if you have a 2014 or older vehicle, it's at the lowest. It's less than the percent that you're paying. On the other side, there's a picture of the Volvo. You'll see um, just showing how the vehicle price would come down as that car ages. So if that car had a $40,000 list price and you paid the full 12 months of the tax, it's about $720 for the personal property tax. By the time it's in its sixth year, it's down to 120 for the personal property tax. So I don't like math, hence the moi ha 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 ha. And I never thought I'd have a job <laughs> that made me do math, but here I am. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to show you guys that this is how you can prorate a registration and do your own estimates and be the life of the party and show everybody how to do this. 
Um, so basically, when we're prorating for less than a year, what we're doing is we're determining the cost per month of your, pers your personal property tax based on the tax rate that we're charging. So we're using, for this example, I'm using a brand new car that's a 2019. So the, um, oops, there it goes. So the uh, five month prorated amount would be $300. Uh, $300. And if we were to go out for 16 months, we get our 12 month fee first, and then we prorate the next set of four months at the next tax rate down because it comes down as the car ages. And so you're looking at 920 for a personal property tax on that. Got that? Yes. Test it a little bit. We'll test later. <laughs> um, there are handouts. Somewhere. Yeah, you guys have them. And you don't have to do anything with it, so you don't have to dig it out now if you don't want to. But uh, when you go home, if you want to look at it, this does explain it more in depth on how we figure out the city amounts and then also a little bit of information on the state amount. I'm not going to get into that as much tonight. that we use, um, this is how we determine, it looks kind of scary until you actually look at it, but this is how we determine how far out your registration is going to go. So you find the um, date of, or the month of birth on this side and then which month you're actually processing it in, and it tells you how many months the registration is. It also shows you which letter of the alphabet for those leases or those businesses is assigned to which month. So you get a good idea if you're leasing a car which month your registration is going to come to it. And we also have some information in there on the various types of plates that you can get from our office. Um, and then there's more in-depth information on the moose plate, which Sandy touched on that a little bit. The extra fees do go towards something, as do state park plate. Um, the state park plates goes towards upkeep of our state parks. And then just before I move on, I just want to point out to you that beginning on October 1st, 2020, you're going to need what's called a real ID if you want to do a domestic flight if you don't have a passport. So the real ID is them just basically vetting you that you're a citizen, you were born here, you are who you say you are. Um, the state of New Hampshire is going to be open the second Saturday of every month from 9 a.m. till noon just to do real ID. So if anyone wants to renew the now, yeah, at Newport and Concord, and there's a couple other locations throughout the state, but Newport is our closest. So if anyone wants to go get their real ID now before it expires, you can. They're only going to charge you $3 to go in and do it if you want to change over now. Um, otherwise, if you're up for renewal, you can go in and renew and get your real ID. I think that covers it for motor vehicles. Is there anything else? Um, there's no anyone have any questions? To, there's no reason to do that before your renewal unless you need it to fly you don't want right to right so if your your um, id say it expires in 2021 yeah. but that begins in 2020 and you want to get it out of the way before that you can certainly go in and do it and only charge you the three dollar reprinting fee um, boat registrations we're now boat agents we've collected seventeen hundred dollars so we know it's not a, a huge revenue booster for the city but it is a really um, nice service to offer to our residents and because it's a state function we can actually offer to people who live in our surrounding areas and we did 121 boat transactions we didn't start until may so a lot of people had already done their boats for the year we expect this number to go up this year and the tax deductible amount is listed on your registration so if you're going to itemize um, your deductions we get this question a lot this time of year which is why i put this slide in you're looking where it says months and mills on the registration. See right there? So this person could claim $435 on their taxes. And then just the state fees, which I'm not going to get into, but basically your state fees are based on the weight of your vehicle. If you have um, a smaller vehicle, like Geo Prism, if you make those anymore, you're looking at like $2.60 a month to the state. A regular sedan, you're looking at about $3.60 a month to the state. And an SUV or a pickup truck, you're looking at about $4.60 to the state. Um, then there's some other one-time fees, like the plate fees. And again, in your handouts, I do have a list of some of the fees and, and the plates associated with them. And now we will jump into dog licensing. Does anyone have any questions on motor vehicle? Yep. 
Um, so if you have a forty thousand dollar car, you pay seven hundred dollars to register. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, personal property tax as opposed to a sales tax. So I know. Well, okay. If, if you're going to say if you're in another state, you'd mm -hmm. be paying sales tax on that, yes, that's true. which would be way. Yeah, yeah. Some of them go up to like eight percent for a sales tax. Some states, so they let you roll it into your loan, so you don't quite feel it. Whereas when you come into us, you're not being able to roll it into your loan. So it is. We recognize it's a pretty hefty fee. Okay. Yeah. We accept credit cards. <laughs> yeah, we accept credit cards now. There's next to you use it. Um, I, what I always tell people is, too, we, we feel your pain just as much as you do. Um, just because we work here, we don't get an employee discount, so we're still playing, paying the same amount. Um, the only advantage we have over you guys, with the exception of now you guys have been taught how to do your own estimates, is that we know exactly what it's going to cost us to go in and register so we can plan it. So dog licensing. Um, dog licensing is a state law, and it's been around since 1891, believe it or not. It was originally started as a way so that people could track the owners of dogs for liability purposes in case a dog got loose and say named a chicken or something. They want to be able to find out who owned that dog. Um, somewhere along the line, they started listing symptoms of hydrophobia on the dog licenses. And hydrophobia is a later stage in rabies. And then that evolved into, oh, well, rabies is probably not a good thing. We need to focus on rabies when it comes to time to get a license. So, we're now licensing our dogs basically for the same reason we did this 128 years ago. We want to make sure we have an owner because if, if your dog gets loose and bites somebody, you're, you're liable for it. So we need to have an owner on record. Um, and we also, um, it's to ensure that you're getting the certificates for your dogs. So uh, you can't procure a, a license for your dog without the rabies certificate. And once your dog is vaccinated, you are required to get a license. So they go hand in hand. Um, this also does assist the police department if your dog gets loose. So we still tell people it's great to microchip your animals, but they don't have those little readers with them in the cruisers. They're going to see that tag on your dog's collar, and then they're going to call us and say, hey, who owns it? And then they can get in touch with you. So um, if you do license your dog, make sure you're putting the tag on. We do have some rabies clinics coming up. Unfortunately, we didn't have all the dates available to give them to you tonight, but if anyone owns a dog and they want to take advantage of the rabies clinics, this information will be on our website very soon. And we will be having one here in yeah. City Hall. We're going to be hosting one here in April. sometime in April. We're still waiting to hear from the vet that we're working with, but there will be a Saturday where we're open from about 9 till noon in April um, doing a rabies clinic, and then we'll also be there on hand to do any dog licensing. So if you need to come in and license your dog before late fees start, come in and see us. Um, so puppies need to be licensed the moment they get their first rabies vaccination. So don't come in and try to license your dog until the rabies <laughs> shot. You're not required to by law until it's had that shot. And that is my puppy. And that's Kuda. <laughs> Kuda loves convertible rides, nice walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> He's single. Um, <laughs> uh, dog licensing is kind of weird. It doesn't run by the calendar year. It actually runs May 1st through April 30th. So right now we're technically still in the 2018 dog licensing year. And uh, the renewals are due by April 30th. We give you the whole month of May to, to take care of the license. So if you're if you're running late on getting it done, don't worry. The fines don't start until June, but um, May is your grace period. So definitely make sure you do it by the end of that. So the cost it's it's pretty minimum really. It's 750 for a puppy or an altered dog, meaning spayed or neutered. Uh, Ten dollars for a dog that's not fixed, that's older than a puppy. If you're a senior citizen, you get one dog for $3. And sometimes what we'll do is, um, if there's a couple, they're, they're both senior citizens and they have two dogs, we'll split it so that they can take advantage of the senior rate for both dogs. And then if you have a group or a commercial kennel, which is five or more dogs, it's $21 to license. Um, state portion, so out of all the licensing fees that we collect, $2 is given for um, the Department of Agriculture for the Animal Population Control Fund. What that fund is used for is for helping people who um, might not be able to afford to have their dog fixed. So they contact them and they can get the dog fixed for a reduced cost. And then the 50 cents per dog license goes to the state diagnostics lab, and that's the lab that tests rabies. So when you see things about foxes getting tested, this is who's doing it, and that money helps pay for that. Um, if you don't license your dog, there's heavy fines, so we, we highly recommend that you do it on time. It's a $25 civil forfeiture fine, which begins in June, and a $1 late fee that accumulates per month until your dog is licensed. So this is per dog. Um, if you have several dogs, this gets expensive really fast, so definitely make sure that you're licensing your dogs on time. 
And come October 1st, sometimes we're still chasing people down. Those people are unfortunately going to get another $10 unlicensed dog fine. And if they still don't take care of it, then they're going to go to court and they can pay up to $50 in the fine. So please, please, please license your dog. Um, so dog stats. <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess at how many dogs we licensed for 2018? No. <laughs> we did 1,892 dogs. And does anyone want to guess what the most popular dog name is in Lebanon? <laughs> uh, somebody throw some names. Just throw a name out there. <laughs> Molly. Molly. That's a good guess. Bella. That's a good guess too. Those are actually both of those are up high on the list. Um, but the most popular is Bella. Oh. And this has been like the top names for the past 11 years that I've worked here. Every time we run this, it's Bella. Um, and anyone want to take a guess as to what the most popular breed is in Lebanon? Golden. Golden. A, a, a golden Retriever or close? Yeah, golden Doodle? Lab. We'll give you a hint. There's a hint. Yeah, last <laughs> three hints right there. It's the Labrador. Oh. <laughs> and that's not including mixes for the most popular breed. Obviously, mixed breeds tend to be the, the most that we have on our list. but. For, for purebred dogs, the Labrador Retriever. They're very good dogs, I used to have one. So online dog licensing, as Sandy touched on earlier, you can renew your dog licensing online now. So this is just for renewals. If you have a new dog, unfortunately, you can't do it online for the first time because it does require the previous year's tag number to do it. So 2018 tags with green fire hydrants that you see right there on your screen. And the number, which is a little hard to read, it's printed down at the bottom. And all you need is that and an email address and you can do it online. And our tags are available now, so if anyone has a dog and they want to license early, feel free to do it. You can do it online, come in and see us, or give us a call and we'll tell you how much to mail to us. And that concludes dog licensing. Does anybody have any questions on anything we've talked about so far? I do. <laughs> so, I have four dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, get yourself one more and you can get Yeah, you can get yourself another. Get yourself another. I was like, another. I'm getting an extra seven bucks. Um, what happens, okay, so they're all healthy and we're being, but your dog dies. Like, you don't get a death certificate for it. Right. So, I would, like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. So what we want you to do, and we know it's hard to, to tell, you know, if they're part of your family, but if you can notify us, even if you can't call us because you're too sad to call us, send us an email, we do have to go in and take that dog out of the records because what happens is if we don't do that, we're going to start sending you letters and nobody wants to get a letter about that because, you know, it can be painful and we're going to keep sending letters until you tell us otherwise. So please, please, please um, tell us. Also, if you don't have the dog, maybe you gave the dog to a new owner, or if you've moved out of Lebanon, it's really helpful if you contact us that way. We're not chasing you down. We actually just wrote it on the form. Yep, yep. and that and works too. Back. And just mail it back to us. Yep, that works perfectly yeah. well too. Anyway, you can do it. Yeah, however, it's I think you can do it online too. But yep. I sent my online yes. things the other day. Yes, exactly. So when you go in, if you want to do it online, you can use last year's tag number to call it up and then you can actually report your dog's deceased rate online. It doesn't charge you to report it. Any more questions? Yes. I think it, you mentioned it's like 1,800 something registrations. Is that new registrations or does that include renewals? That, that includes renewals. That's how many tags we've issued. <laughs> that's, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Questions? In case anybody is curious, the state of oh, New Hampshire yeah. does have a law in place that allows municipalities, if they choose to, to license cats. Well, you're not choosing. We're not choosing. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard no. enough managing the dogs. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and one more thing too. I, has anyone um, heard of our top dog contest that we do? Have yeah. anyone seen that coming in? Yeah. Yeah. Why isn't mine one yet? <laughs> we have a discussion with the mayor. She's yeah. the one that pulls them out. <laughs> so it is a random drawing. We do ask people to give us pictures because they're really fun to put on the wall in our office, and we put them on our website, but. The pictures, no matter how cute your dog is, isn't going to get you a winning uh, dog. You do have to just luck of the draw. So the mayor will draw three winners. Usually it's done during the first council meeting in May. So the contest isn't open yet. Yep, everybody loves it. It's fun. Dog. It's fun. It's one of my favorite things because all the pictures come to me and I'm like, oh! <laughs> and she'll say, look at this! Oh, look at this dog! <laughs> <laughs> people get very creative with their pictures. Yes. And we have great sponsors in the community yeah, that help the sports for, so we can give out great prizes and stuff like that. So that's a good thing. All right. So does anybody feel the need to take like a quick five minute break before we jump into elections? Because I can go on all night about elections. <laughs> all right. Elections. This is
is my favorite part. <laughs> so lots of information to go over talking about elections. Um, as most everybody knows, <coughs> Lebanon has three separate wards, and basically each ward is an administrative division of the city and is represented by elected councilors. Councilors. Uh, the city has the three wards. The population within the wards determines the boundaries, so we have to have a deviation no more than 5% between each ward. So every 10 years, at least every 10 years, um, using the results of the census, we examine the ward lines and make any adjustments that we need to to keep within that 5% deviation. Does anybody know how many registered voters we have in Lebanon currently, or even want to guess? 12,000. Okay, so our, we, our population base is 14,530. And so, a little under that. We have 9,281. Mm -hmm. And that's the breakdown per ward. And Lebanon is a very transient community, especially in certain areas up near the Mount Support Road, Sachem Village and stuff. So we usually end up readjusting the ward lines more than every 10 years um, just to keep, I, let me back that up, not readjusting the ward lines, but adjusting the voter registrations if we have to, um, to go through that process. Um, we do that probably like every four or five years so that we don't have this huge voter checklist when in reality there's not that many voters in Lebanon. Uh, and the reason being is the number of registered voters determines how many uh, voting booths and stuff you have to have at each ward. So the, sometimes the number of voters gets up over 10,000. One time it was close to 11,000. And it's just because so many people are coming in and registering to vote. And then when they leave, we don't know that they've left. There's a process that you have to go through, which we'll get to in a minute, that talks about how, uh, the, how you can remove voters from the checklist. But we do do a checklist purge every so many years. 2017 was the last one that we did. So this is, and, and that brought it down to, I think, it was like 78, 7,900 voters. So you can see in just a couple of years, we're back up to 92, 91. And I suspect after next year's um, presidential primary, we'll probably be up closer to the 11,000, 12,000 range again. But then after that, we'll have the census coming out and we'll be doing a purge and readjusting the war lines at that time. And this is just a five cycle average of voter turnout by the different types of elections. Our local election, as you can see, is only, the average is 18%. We have a local election next week, Tuesday. Get out and vote. Let's increase that percentage. The state primary is always the lowest voter turnout. Um, that's the September primary. That's every other year. The state general election on the non-presidential years is 47%. Um, the presidential primary is a good number at 43. And the presidential general elections is 71%. Um, but that type of volume of turnout, it, it's very challenging for everybody getting the poll set up and getting the number of uh, correct number of helpers that we need at the polls and everything. And the, the interesting, from interesting, the, the fact is whether we have one, one voter show up or 12,000 voters show up, it's the same process and the same setup for each election. And we'll talk a little bit about the election officials and their roles. So my position as city clerk, I'm the chief elections official for the city of Lebanon. The powers that I have over the local election are equivalent to the Secretary of State for the state and federal elections. The clerk staff helps out. We have moderators, supervisors of the checklist, board clerks, ballot clerks, and then extra election workers that we for the bigger elections. So some of my Roles. I have to oversee the whole election process, the setting up, the coordinating, the ordering the ballots, and um, the advertising, basically everything. And of course, my staff helps with that. We test out voting machines ahead of time, um, posting warrants. I won't read the whole list. You can that yourself. There's a lot, a lot involved. And the clerk staff, they help with voter registrations. They take in voter registrations in our office downstairs. We then pass them on to the supervisors of the checklist who actually do the data entry into the statewide voter registration system by adding the voters to the checklist. Um, we help out, we do absentee ballots, and staff is just willing to jump in and help out wherever we need them. 
the moderator. The moderator is an elected position, and that is the person that you usually see standing by the ballot box in your polling location. Sometimes if they have to take a break and somebody helps out, but the moderator is in charge of that polling location on election day. So if any issues come up, they address them. They usually call me and we talk about it and stuff. We don't usually get very many issues coming up, but they preside over the polling location and are responsible for making sure the thing is running smoothly. Um, they process any returned absentee ballots, and they do some paperwork at the end of the night. The supervisors of the checklist, they are um, elected positions. There's three per ward, and they're two-year terms. Uh, they register the new voters, they do address changes, party changes, anything related to the information in the state system. And they um, usually have several sittings throughout the year to register new voters. How does that differ from what you guys are doing? They, we take in the voter registration forms, they actually accept oh, them. Oh. They have to sign them and then they enter the information into it. They have that responsibility. We just take them in for them, check and make sure everything's yeah, complete, but they make that decision. <clears throat> and in your packet too, there is some information on voter registration and what you have to have to do to register to vote. The ward clerks. These are the people, they're, they're elected to your terms, one per ward. These are the people that hand you your ballot when you go into the polls. And so they're in charge, they count the ballots ahead of time to make sure they know the exact number. Um, and then they hand them out during the day, keeping track of how many, because they have to make sure all the paperwork at the end of the night, everything's been accounted for. And then they tally results and go from there. And ballot clerks. Ballot clerks are appointed by the supervisors of the checklist um, if they're not assigned by the party representatives. In the state of New Hampshire, there's two parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Those parties can appoint ballot clerks to work at the polls. They don't usually, sometimes it's just hard to find people to do it, but we've been local, lucky locally that we've been able to find people to do it. There's four, four, four per word, and those are the ones that will ask you for your ID and your name when you come into the polls. They check you off on the checklist and make sure you're given the right ballot. And they, the process for marking off the checklist is outlined in state law. It's like a three-page handout, if you want to call it, that exactly how you have, what you have to ask for, where you have to make a mark. It even has in there that you need to use a ruler to draw a line across this and stuff. So there's a very detailed process that goes into marking the checklist. It's not just one simple little check mark. And we're going to talk about the voting machine now. And to help with this, we have a celebrity guest. We have a celebrity guest, Vanna. Come on in, Vanna. <laughs> so Vanna's going to help us out with our little voting machine demo. She's nice enough to come and keep us entertained. Thank you, Vanna. Not a problem. How was your play? Yeah. Mom, it's my ears mess. <laughs> scanner ballot can counting device, which is this machine right here. It actually comes out and is kept in a little carrying bag with non inclusive poles. And um, each unit is loaded with a memory card, which is that, and it goes into a slot and that's on the ballot is programmed into this memory card by the ballot company that does this. Um, they're the ones that we bought the machines from and they do all the, the, the calculating. So that information is stored there. And being an optical scanner, when the ballots go through the machine, it reads it and it stores that data on that card. And we'll show you how we get off, get that data, get off stuff. Which way do you put the ballot in? We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> um, so. So as far as voting machines go, these AccuVote machines are actually getting quite old and they're becoming older technology. So the state is currently looking at some possible new machines 
And for any new machines to be put in use, it has to go through this laborious process of going to the ballot law commission of the state of New Hampshire. They have to approve anything relating to elections. So there's currently like three or four companies that have proposed some new optical scanner type of, of products. And Kristen actually went down to see a demo of Vanna went down to see a demo of them <laughs> um, a couple of weeks ago. And so the state is working through that process. And it would be nice to get some updated machines because eventually these will become obsolete. But for now, they function great. And we test them out before every election. And part of the testing process is we take anywhere from 25 to 50 ballots, mark them up randomly, and do a hand tally of that. And then we run those ballots through the machine, and they're put in four different ways, any way that could possibly go through. And we test it that way. And uh, yeah, we just make and we repeat that six times. Each machine has two cards. One memory card is the primary one, and then a backup one, should we have a fail with that. So we could just swap it out. And we've had machines fail before, and we have a spare here that we can swap out. And the company that provides the machines, they actually, on election day, they are out and about in the areas with extra ones in their car. So if the town has an issue, they can just swoop right in and give you a new one. So they're great about that. And that just shows the four different directions. And then once the, at the end of the night, once all the ballots are done going through, we put what's called an ender card through here. It tells the machine, that's it, we're done, election's over with, no more ballots. And then it will print out a tape, and I'll have you guys come up here in a minute after I talk about this, so you can see it and everything up close. But it prints out this machine tape here that has all the results on it. And that's what we use as the final document for the voting, voting results. Um, the ballot box. This black part here is called the ballot box that the machine sits on. There's several components of the ballot box. Right here, if a, if a ballot would not go through the machine or if we get what's called the UOCAVA ballots from informed and overseas citizens, they don't use regular ballots. We use different paper ballots for them. So if it won't go through the machine, it gets dropped into the slot here. And then at the end of the night, we take them out of here. <laughs> and we hand count those. But the rest of the ballots, will end up in these two slots. If somebody does a write-in vote, the machine will recognize that and kick it into one section. So we take all those ballots that have write-ins at the end of the night and pull them out and do a hand count of the write-ins. So does every every voting place have that very same yes. machine, even in Nashville yep. or Concord? Or no. Not all um, towns and cities in New Hampshire have voting machines. Some are still hand count towns. Oh, okay. But the big cities, yes. Manchester has 12 wards. Um, Nashua has nine wards. Laconia has six wards. Any and bigger community. Yep. Yeah. So if you want to come up and take a look at this, I'll show some personal a little bit. You're welcome to do that. And I'll even show you what it looks like inside. Mark on the edge 
uh, on the edge here instead of here. Actually, it happens often over here. Instead of filling in the oval, they'll mark here. So the machine sometimes won't read the ballot at all. So we'll take it out if it won't go through. We don't look at how the person voted. We just kind of look to see if marks are funny. If they are, the voter can either choose to get another ballot. You can get up to three ballots to redo it, or we can hand count it. And if we do that, we drop it in the side <laughs> and hand count it later at night. So when we come out, we'll right after they put it in? Right. It would, it's, the machine would spit it, spit it out. Spit it out. It, was, it wouldn't go in. And get it'll pop it right out of that. Yeah. And that's what the tape looks like on this. Thing right? Exactly. Yes, yes. yes. Exactly. exactly. Like that. Let me just show you a couple more things. <laughs> Quick question for Dan. So you mentioned they're looking at new voting machines. Are they all optical reads so that there's always a paper trail? Yes. New yes. yeah. Hampshire will always have a paper yes. trail. Yeah. Yeah. And they're very, very cool. I was really excited to go see the demos. Just don't get what Florida has. <laughs> no, 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 I was in Florida last week. That's why I didn't well, make it to the demo. Shake your hand, go hug. So the you're machine you're itself, you're it has security tags every which way. It has security tags over the port, and if these were peeled up, it would say void, so you knew it was tampered with. So these are in no time ever connected to the internet or any source like that. So it makes it that they're very, um, you know, safe for the most part. And anytime any maintenance is done where they have to open up the machine, the maintenance company, they put the seals and stuff like that on it. And then there's one spot here as well where they can open it up and get into it. So when you go to vote on Tuesday, take a look at what the feed is here. It tells you how many ballot count is. <laughs> Keeping in mind that it is a ballot, a school ballot. So if you divide it by two, you know how many voters have come. So you can always take a peek at that there. And like I said, this is the, uh, the slot where the card goes in. At all times, this is sealed up with a security tag. Yep. This here and then the um, canvas bag, once we put the machines back in there, have to be sealed up. And we have a log that where every time we get into this machine for maintenance, for testing, for a demo, we have to log it in here in the appropriate section, whether we took the key off and the key number and two sign, witnesses sign it for the memory card area. This is the area where um, maintenance is done, so we have to sign that. So we go through the whole testing process each time. We certify, Kristen and I certify that it successfully completed its test and it matched the numbers on the tally sheet. And the funniest part is, the machine's always right. We are always all on our tallies, no matter how hard you try, going through and marking them. So we're like, oh, we're off. We know the machine's right. So then we have to go through and verify that, yep, the machine was right. It's really nice to know you can't count as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> and then the moderator signs us on election day and the stays part with the, uh, with the unit as well. So that's the quick and down on the voting machine debt. This is a sample of a tape that it prints out. This was from the test that we did. It gives all the results. You want to know who won the election? <laughs> it says test on there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you ever, so, yeah, you ever get a, an error? We do. do, do um, we have a whole list of, of um, instructions and stuff like that. If the machine has a jam or something, when they're putting something in there, it will tell you on here whether the ballot was read or whether it was not read. And so all the moderators are trained. Before you do anything, look at the screen and see what it says. And so that way we know whether to keep trying to put it in, and, and it won't go in. It goes into the side and gets hand counted that way. Will it count it if it's half read, or will that count as no reads? So it, it either reads it all, or, or it doesn't. so it only yep. writes the results right. if, yep. all, if the whole yep. ballot is in. Yep, exactly. And I know last year one town had an issue where. One of the voters apparently had snow on their gloves and it got the ballot wet. I don't know if you saw that on the news. And so they, here's my ballot, put it in. It was a wet, soggy ballot. Jammed up the machine. Yeah. They had to uh, yes. dig their spare out. Yes. And things yes. like that happened. I mean, so I remember. what would you do then if you've got like half the days of the totals on one machine? And then the, the totals are always on that card. So you move the card. So we take the card out and so you put it in the machine. So as the card doesn't fail. Yep. Sure. And we have had a card fail before too. I think it was my second year as the city clerk. And it was a president, no, it was a general election. It 
was five o'clock, it was board two. Gary Mayo was the moderator. He calls me up, Sandy, we have a problem. <laughs> so tell me about it. <laughs> and so basically what we did at that point, it was it was a complete card failure, the first time that's ever we have never had it happen since. Oh, oh but knock on wood. We had <laughs> <laughs> we took all the ballots out of there, put them in a secured box, replaced the machine, and got our backup memory card, which we had, and had to run all through again. So trying to do that with a line, it was, but got it done, and I'm getting good at troubleshooting. <laughs> Just in time to change the machines. That's right. <laughs> we'll learn how to troubleshoot those. The, the nice part with the new ones, they'll be more digital. So you'll have computer printouts and stuff, as opposed to tapes. The machines are like in China. Yeah, no. <laughs> the state is super, super strict when it comes to the ballot machines. Some, some of the parts. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. How old are these, just out of curiosity? Um, these are approximately 20 years old. Wow. Yeah, because I've been here for this clerk for 15, and they were in, okay, well, they're 25 years. They're a good 10 years, I think. It's pretty old technology. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you they still, anymore. you know, being the optical scan reader, I mean,
printed you out a fax that you then took to the ballot person that got put in the device was really hard to understand. So even though this is an accessible system, anybody can use it. So if you want to try it, oh, you can't try it out Tuesday. Anybody can use it for elec all elections except local elections. Because the system was funded by federal funds, um, there's restrictions on what, what you can use it for. However, the state is working with municipalities to try to come up with a system that we can use for our local elections as well, because people who depend on these need to be able to vote these in all elections. So that is in the process of trying to get that to come around to be the same system or very similar system. Right now, we could buy our own independent system, but then it's the process of, of you know, paying to get it set up. It, it, it's a little cost prohibitive at this time. Um, so hopefully with the state system, we'll be able to get that up and running. Do you have a sense of how many people use it? Not many. And uh, you know, a lot of people will bring somebody with them, a family member or something, to help them out. Um, and you know, we try to promote it, we can, and it's available, but people have a tendency of gravitating towards the comfort level. There are some communities that have more people that use use it, and so that's great, but we find that it isn't used very much here. I can only recall a handful of times. We usually have a couple of our election officials use it in the past before it didn't print out these regular ballots, we'd have a couple of election officials wait to the end of the night, and if somebody came in to use the machine, then they would use it too, so that it wasn't just one odd ballot, so that at least there were a few to keep that privacy of their vote. Um, and we do that now with this, but generally we don't get very much use of that. But it's pretty cool. <laughs> you think, do people know about it, do you think? I mean, um, the state promotes it, it's in our literature and stuff, but I don't think people really realize that it's available. Tell your friends. And, <laughs> and the previous system was very cumbersome. This is much better. So anybody that, I remember one voter did try to use the previous system and found it so cumbersome, they just gave up and did it the other way. So but this works, and it works great. So and the state was very pleased that I asked to borrow one so we could do a demo of it. Well, let us know how it goes. So did you like the demo? Yes. The good information, <laughs> good to know about? Yeah. Great, I'll let them know that. So with that, before we move on to this next sec section, Vanna, could you please tell me why you came to help us out tonight? Because I love the city of Lebanon. It's a great community, and I really think that people should volunteer a lot more for their community. So if anyone in this room would like to volunteer, I do know we have a couple of board members in here with us. Um, we're looking for board members and committee members and also people to help us at the elections. So if anybody's interested in working with the polls, please give me your contact information. We have our regulars, but we always need extras, especially next year is going to be a big year, so we'll be recruiting. Have you got your name? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, just a quick little behind the scenes to look at elections, planning and budgeting. Um, the planning and budgeting begins months in advance. I think I alluded to that earlier about the amount of time that's spent preparing for elections. Um, the basic cost of an election is eight to twelve thousand dollars. The big expenses are um, programming the memory cards, buying the ballots. For the state elections, the state covers the cost of the ballots, and we just have to do the programming. But then election officials are paid positions, not a lot, but they are paid. And then different supplies and stuff like that that make up that that cost. Um, there are many deadlines that the state sets, and we follow those to the T. And uh, it, we usually plan out our year's elections a year in advance, and we have a calendar, literally, of what to do each day, many things to do each day, so that when we're super busy with everything going on, we don't miss a step and aren't missing any deadlines for posting warrants and getting notices and stuff out. So that seems to work really well being organized like that. After the polls close, have you ever wondered what happens when everything's all done? <laughs> well, this is what happens. The moderator prints out the tape, which we show to the tape. Let me show you that again. Um, the moderator then removes the ballots from the box, separates the pile for the write-ins and any other piles that need to be hand counted that wouldn't fit through the or wouldn't go through the machine. And then the election officials tabulate those, do hand tallies of those. Um, they seal all the ballots and everything up when they're done using special red tape that has a security seal on it. So if the tape was broken, it says, you know, I don't have to worry about it, I forgot what it says, because we never open it. Once ballots, once an election is over, 
the ballots for any state and federal elections have to be kept for 22 months. So we have a vault downstairs where we store these ballots. Local elections, they only need to be kept for 60 days. So we have a whole room full of ballots on those busy election years. Um, yeah, so we, they pack up the supplies, they bring paperwork and ballots and everything back to us. I mean, us, usually Chris and I, and often Maury. They come back to our office. We then take the information off the tapes and we um, type it onto the city's website. So as results are coming in, we're able to get them up there right away. And it's live, you see us as we're posting it, basically. Um, then we have a bunch of paperwork to do for state and federal elections. We have forms that have to be completed. They're completed at the polls, but they bring them back to us. We verify everything, and we um, send them down to the state that night. Um, the police department takes them to Hanover Dispatch, and then there's a sheriff that takes them from Hanover Dispatch. That's one of the areas that um, everybody can drop them off, one of the drop off spots. And then they bring them down to Concord. And then we just have quite a few bits and pieces of post-election work to do the following day. That's just a picture of some of the supplies. Um, for the city election, we have to notify those that were the successful candidates, have them come in, take their oath, and we do a de debriefing after each election generally just to make sure everything went smooth, if there's anything we could do to make it better, and we get input from our election officials to make sure that, that we're doing everything that they need to do. We figure if the election runs smoothly, we've done our job. Um, our job is to get it set up so that on election day, things go great for the election officials. And you'll also see in your packet, did we put one in the packet? Yeah. There is one, yeah. The Attorney General's checklist. The AG's office sends people to all polling locations in the state on the big elections, the general elections and presidential elections, um, and often the presidential primaries too. They have a huge checklist of what they're looking for to make sure that all the, the um, polling locations are set up in compliance with state and federal laws. So it kind of gives you an idea of all the things that we need to be thinking about and making sure are adequate. Absentee ballots. I'm going to let Kristen slash Anna hop in on this one. Has anyone ever applied for an absentee ballot before? Just out of curiosity. And for those of you who haven't, did you know that these were available? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so first we're gonna talk about qualifying for an absentee ballot. So you might hear a lot on the news, um, a lot on TV about early voting. The state of New Hampshire does not do early voting. These are um, absentee ballots and you have to qualify for them. So not just anybody can come in and ask for an absentee ballot. Um, you, you basically can't be able to appear in person on election day for the following reasons. So a physical disability, if you are physically unable to get to the polling place, you can apply for a ballot. Um, if you have a religious observance that keeps you from attending on election day, you can get one. Um, if you're going to be absent, you're going on a trip, or you're just going to be out of town for the day for work, that'll do it. Employment obligations. So employment obligations, um, it's, it's not just your standard nine to five job that we're looking at, it's also people who are providing child care and adult care. And those are people who cannot leave their charges in order to go and appear on election day. And that is with or without compensation. So you don't necessarily have to be paid for caring for the children. It's considered an employment obligation. And a new one that's just starting this year is um, winter weather warning. So for the last two years, we've been super lucky and had terrible weather on our election day. But the good news is it didn't stop people. We still had a really good turnout. People came out and voted anyways. Um, so now what they're saying is if there is a winter, winter weather warning that's been administered by the National Weather Service and it's the Monday before the election only, you can come in and see us and get an absentee ballot. But this is only for people who are physically disabled who otherwise would have gone um, to the polls that day but maybe the snow prevents them from safely getting to their vehicle to get there. Or again, for people who um, are watching children who might have been in school that day but now are staying home. So. It's only open for those few. Um, to obtain an absentee ballot, you can't just call us. Um, you can't just pop one in the mail to you. Actually, you have to give us a request in writing. And you can either download an application, which is right on our website, and you can send it to us. Or you can write us a letter. If you write us a letter, it does need to include your name, your address, where we're mailing the ballot to if it's not your home address. So if you're in Florida for the winter, we need to know where to send it. We need to know your ward. 
you need to know why. So again, because you have to qualify, you have to tell us, oh, I'm, I'm absent for um, the election because I'm in Florida for the winter. And then you have to sign it. We do require a signature of the voter before we can send a ballot. Um, if you are receiving assistance, maybe you are visually impaired and you can't see to fill this out, so somebody else is filling out the application for you, your assistant must now also sign the application showing that they provided assistance. And if it's a primary election, you do need to tell us your party affiliation. So on that note, party affiliation, if you're on the checklist as an undeclared voter and you send us an absentee ballot application, you have to tell us which party you want because there's no undeclared ballot. So we have to know if we're sending you the Republican or the Democratic ballot. Um, if you're on the checklist already and you are affiliated as either a Republican or a Democrat, that's the ballot you're going to get. So if you're on the checklist as a Democrat, but you want the Republican ballot or vice versa, you're not going to get the one you asked for. You're going to get what you registered as. Um, so update to voter laws. Again, we just talked about this with the assisting the absentee voters. Um, so in addition to signing that absentee ballot application, the person who is assisting, or it can actually be a separate assistant, there's also a spot on an affidavit envelope, which I'm going to show you a picture of in just a moment, that the assistant also has to sign. And again, they do not need to be the same assistant, same voter, not same assistant. So that's a picture of the affidavit envelope. The arrow is pointing to where the assistant signs. Up above that, you'll see where the voter signs. And there's two sections. There's one that's for um, absence from city or town or absence because of a religious observance or a physical disability. So if, if you're doing an employment obligation, just use the absence from the city or town. And then the other um, item that's up there is the absentee ballot application. And again, the arrow is pointing to where the assistant would sign. The voter signs just up above it. And who can obtain my absentee ballot? According to the law, you're the only one that can obtain it. So you do have to make your request in writing. You don't necessarily have to appear in person. You can send your application through the mail. You can fax it to us. You can scan and email it to us. You can send the application in with a friend. But we're going to mail that ballot to you unless you've come in to see us in person. And who can return the absentee ballot? So you can return your own absentee ballot. You just can't return it on election day because you're not absent. You need to go vote in person. Um, if you're coming in, there's a new thing now where the state is asking that you bring in your photo ID. This is not mandatory. They're just asking, to, just helps us speed up the process when we're processing the absentee ballots that day. Um, we have a green drop box next to City Hall. I don't know if anyone's noticed that. It looks like a mailbox. It's green. It's got the city seal on it. Don't put your ballots in there. If you put your ballot in there, we're not allowed to count that by law. We're actually going to call you and say, hey, you need to come do a new ballot if there's time for you to do it. And we have your phone. And if we have your phone number, which the form does give a spot to put your phone number or an email address, so please list at least one of those so we can get in touch with you just in case. And there's another new law um, that started, I think it was a couple years ago now, where family members can now return your ballot for you. So it would have to be your spouse, parent, child, or a sibling. They don't have to show proof that they're related to you. They're signing the form under penalty of law. Um, they do need to show photo ID, so you couldn't send in a, a school-aged child because they're not going to have a, a government-issued ID that we're going to look at. Um, step relations are acceptable, but in-laws are not, so my mother-in-law could not go return my ballot for me. And when the person comes in who is the family member, they're also asked for photo ID, and they sign a form telling us what their relation is and, and that they're dropping the ballot off for which voter. Um, you can also track your ballot and some other interesting information. So the state of New Hampshire has a very aptly named New Hampshire Voter Information Lookup website. And you can look up your information just as it says. So you can locate your ward and polling place using this website. You can verify, verify your party affiliation. You can check the status of your absentee ballot. So if you sent us an application, you're not sure if we got it, and it's after hours and you don't want to call us, you can check that and you can see it'll show you if we've received it. It'll also show you when we've sent you your ballot and when we've received it back. It updates every 24 hours, so if I receive your application that day and I enter it into the computer, you're not going to see it until the next day that we've gotten it. Um, you can get this link right on our website and the link is located at the bottom and there's also in your handouts, there is a page that gives you that website and it's in bigger print so you can read it a lot better. And the reason that we focus so much on the absentee ballots and where to sign and stuff, for every election, at least two, at least two, sometimes up to 10 or more ballots are challenged because they're missing signatures on the affidavit envelope 
or something, the affidavit envelope is there. So we're trying to get the word out as much as possible to ensure that every ballot we get back is going to be able to be counted. So if you happen to be helping somebody with their ballot or something, just watch out for those key things. I mean, we send out instructions included with the absentee ballots, but you know, instructions, you know how we all are with instructions. I can pick this out. So we just want to reinforce so, that. So I'll just show you just very, very briefly. So when you get your ballot in the mail, it's going to come in an envelope that looks like this. These are the instructions that Sandy was talking about. Again, there are, there's a lot of words hung here. You might not read them all. So we're going to give you just a quick demonstration. Inside, you're going to pull out your ballot. This is just a sample ballot that we have for this purpose tonight. Um, so there's your ballot. And then you have a return envelope, which your information will be printed up here already for you. And then this is the affidavit envelope that we are looking for signatures on. So you need to make sure this is signed. If this is not signed, you can't count your ballot. So please make sure. After you fill in your ballot, you're going to seal it up in the affidavit envelope. Make sure it's signed. Seal it up. And then you're going to seal that inside the return and send it to us sealed up like that standard postage to send it back. Um, don't forget, like again, to, to double seal it. Everything needs to be sealed in here. And that's it. Okay. Okay. We're going to just go through a few quick, frequently asked questions. Um, why do I need to announce my name? It's state law. You walk up to the ballot clerk who's going to check you in, and you have to announce your name. They'll repeat your name, and you have to verify your address. Lots of times people might have a new address, they'll give the new address and it actually puts them in a different ward. And then we have to send you to the other ward. Unless of course it's five minutes to seven at night, the poll's about to close, they will let you vote there and then change your address afterwards. Um, what party affiliations are recognized in Vermont, Republican and Democratic? Sure. For a while, New Hampshire, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we try to be entertaining, keep that energy <laughs> going. Everyone's Apparently, energy. I need it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, New Hampshire. For uh, for a couple of years, we had the Libertarian Party because they received enough votes to get that, but they didn't this past election, so they are no longer recognized in New Hampshire. Um, can I change my party affiliation at my polling location? You can for any general election or local election. For the primaries, the only time you can change your party at a primary is if you're undeclared going in. You pick a party ballot and then you can revert back to undeclared going out. Other than that, you have to change after um, after election day. And it can be done in our office. We've got forms to fill out. We pass on to the supervisors and they take care of that. Do I need, yes? What happened, you, you mentioned um, the absentee ballot. You have to spe ask for, specify which ballot you want. So if you're an undeclared voter and you pick a party for a primary. Yep. It puts you in that party so, once you take that. But what we do for those undeclared voters is we include in with your absentee ballot a party change form. Oh. So send it back with the ballot, we'll revert you right back. We just started doing that last year. Yeah, a couple of years. years ago. Yeah, we found that's been helpful to people. Otherwise, people have to remember to revert back. And every primary election, a lot of voters come in, I know I'm in this party, and I would never have voted this party or that party, and you did. Here's the checklist. <laughs> um, do I need to show photo ID? Yes, state law requires photo ID. If a voter does not have photo ID, um, they are allowed to sign this, C it's called the CVA Challenge Voter Affidavit, and have their picture taken. <laughs> and um, if, if they refuse to take it for religious reasons, um, we don't have to take their picture for that, but any other reasons we do have to, and otherwise they won't be able to vote. Why have I been asked to remove or cover campaign materials? Because again, it's the law. <laughs> and it's inside the polls along that 10 foot barrier leading up to the polls is an old ele electioneering zone. Um, people who are voters are supposed to be able to come in and go to their polls unimpeded and not being, not harassed, but pressure. you know, pressured and stuff to vote either way, and especially inside the polls. So if somebody comes in and has a hat with a button on it or a shirt or something, we'll ask them to take the hat off, we'll ask them to either, you know, cover the shirt or something, and we actually do have at the polling locations these big gray t-shirts that we can let somebody borrow while they're in there. Yes? Um, is that strictly relevant to like that that year's election 
Like, if I came in in 2020 wearing a shirt that says Perot 96, would I be kicked out or no? That's a good question. Um, I think they would discourage any type of political because it might be showing a favoritism to a party, even though that candidate is not. So I guess I would encourage people or discourage people from wearing any type of political material coming in. But that is a good question, and that's what I'm going to follow up and check on. Can I request that my name removed from the voter checklist? No, once you're on it, that's it. You're on it. Go. <laughs> um, we can't. If somebody wants to have their name taken off because they're sick of the phone calls and stuff like that, we can't take you off for that reason. If somebody passes away and we're notified officially, like through the State Vital Records Program, we get reports from them monthly as to any deceased people within Lebanon, would we automatically take that people off. If somebody registers to vote in another um, New Hampshire city, that automatically puts them in that city or town, so it removes you from our checklist. If you register to vote in another state and that state notifies us that you've registered there, then we can pull you off. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you're kind of stuck until we do a purge. And if the purge is done, um, if you haven't, to, if you haven't voted in the last four election cycles, then we can purge your name. And we send you a letter saying, you know, we're getting ready to purge you, or you're being purged. You need to come in and register to vote and notify us if you're still there and still want to remain on the checklist. So if you're purged, you do allow the same day registration? Yes, absolutely. Yep, yep, so you can get Just back on. Because yep. sometimes um, when we do a purge, we have to go by the mailing address. Some people will sometimes have a P.O. box and not let us know that they've changed it. So it goes to that P.O. box, so it comes back to us. We're like, oh, they're not here anymore. They're going to get purged. So that happens often with addresses. And while we're on the subject of addresses, I know this causes confusion sometimes. We're all on different databases. Even in our office, my motor vehicle database is different from my election database. So just because you updated it on your car registration doesn't mean that we've updated on your, your um, voting. So if you're coming in to do an address change, tell us and we'll get you all the forms you need to do it. Um, also, if you've moved and you've updated it with your you know tax and water and sewer bills, it doesn't trickle down to us. We're not even attached to the stuff that they're on. So you get a follow up, unfortunately, with different places and make sure everything's changed. Because most of our stuff runs off the state systems. Um, how much of my voting information is open to the public, your name, your domicile address, your mailing address, your ward, and your party affiliation are public is public information. Your date of birth, registration date, copies of your voter registration forms are not. Uh, Mark checklists are available for public <coughs> inspection and people can purchase them and that basically just shows who voted for that election. Yes? Question. Um, so if you, I think it's not level alert. I don't think that there's some text <laughs> um, version of that where you get the little you get the notice that there is a supervisor check of the checklist meeting on Saturday morning from 10 to 10 30 um, what is the what are the residents intended to know that they can do at that point like what is the the, the supervisors of the session are required to have supervisor sessions between seven, six and 10 days prior to each election, also the day before a filing period. Um, so they're required to have a half hour supervisor session and you can determine the day and a little bit of give there and the time and stuff like that. But that's for people to come in and register to vote, to make address changes, party changes, any of that type of stuff. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Yeah, I just wondered what happened with those yeah, little half hours. Come check it out sometime. <laughs> yeah. We don't get very many people that come to them. <laughs> yes. This question and it really entirely depends on us. We moved and we, we were in Ward 3. We moved, we were in Ward 1. And we had to, you know, bring a... You had to re-register in that yeah, ward. Yeah, we had to re-register. But now, if I show the photo ID, I didn't feel like driving to Newport. Yep. to get a new license and it has the old address. That, that's fine. They're looking at the photo ID for your picture. Oh, okay. and your name. And your name. Yeah, they don't look at the yeah. address. Yeah, because oh, okay. people they change and they don't change their addresses on there. My license right. still has a son of BPO box on it, so. <laughs> they might raise an eyebrow at you. Be a master. And we do, they, they also, when you're marking off the checklist, if somebody shows a photo ID that's from another state, 
they have to make a note on the checklist of the two-letter abbreviation for that state, and that information information gets entered into the statewide voter registration system. It's one of the statistics and information that the state keeps. 2019 elections, one Tuesday. See everybody there? 7-7. Seven, seven. <laughs> And upcoming party affiliation change deadline for the, the next election after next Tuesday is going to be the 2020 presidential primary. It will be sometime in January, February. We don't know. Long ways away from knowing. But it, the deadline for making party changes prior to that, to that election has been tentatively set for November 1st. So if you want to make sure you're in the party you want to be in or are undeclared status, do it before November 1st to be on the safe side. So one of the things that confuses people a lot with this, if, if you are undeclared, just remember there is no reason to declare prior to going. You just show up that day and tell them what ballot you want. We do get a lot of phone calls asking that, so just get that out there. Um, and so basically the party changes really if you just want to change back to undeclared or switch to Republican. Or Democrat. So um, having lived in other states, they provide some or at least some of the states that I've provide these great voter information packets with information on candidates, on ballot measures, on all sorts of things. I've found that the ones here are, shall we say, a little skinny. I mean, I know that's it's typically done by the state as opposed to... Well, the League of Women Voters used to do some of this information out there, but they, I think they stopped doing that. Um, but we have as much as we can on our web. Municipalities have to be careful of what we have. We don't want to be promoting one candidate and stuff like that. We encourage people when it comes to like state and federal elections, we encourage people to go to the local um, primary offices and gather the information on their candidates and stuff. I just wonder like, yeah. if there's any discussion even at the state levels for New Hampshire. Yeah, for yeah. yeah I think everybody's kind of like <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, even if it's like, often a candidate provided like information, one, you know, a paragraph of each candidate is given a certain amount of, you know, space, and that's, e you know, equal access to that, to yeah. help voters actually be yeah, more yeah, informed yeah. about the issues that yep. candidates and, you know, ballot right. measures. Right. So going into the local elections, we always have a candidate's night. It's hosted by the Chamber of Commerce. I don't know if anyone's aware of that. It was, it was just like the fifth. It was on Tuesday night or something. Um, yeah, it was just this past Tuesday. So that does give people the opportunity to go. You can hear the school board present their, um, their warrant articles, and you can meet the candidates who are running for city council and for school board. And I think um, when they're zoning, do they discuss the zoning questions at all? But no, but you can always contact their codes and planning office for any zoning amendments. There aren't any this year on the ballot. And usually the city puts out good information regarding the amendments on our website. Um, are they ever, the state of New Hampshire, thinking about either voter vote, vote order or just mailing in your ballot? They, they've been very reluctant. Um, I'd be surprised to see anything like that come about. Their, their way of doing the voter voter was to have election day registration. So being able to register at the polls on election day. I know there's been proposed legislation. I think there's something in this year's session that people can register to vote when they register their cars at the state or something like that. I saw something about that there. And as far as absentee voting for no reason, every um, cycle for the state with the laws, legislative session, usually somebody brings up proposing to have absentee voting for just no reason. Um, and it usually gets See, it's not even, in some states, it's not considered absentee. Right. It's, it's just the way you vote. Yeah. There are yeah. no polling places. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. I don't see that happening in New Hampshire. New Hampshire's pretty set in their ways, and they like their paper. And uh, they have got, New Hampshire has quite a reputation across the United States about how well run the elections are. And, you know, for a while there, you heard about bus loads. That was a whole issue. We heard about the state end of it and everything, and it just simply is not happening. Um, we have our paper record. You have your paper record, you have your paper record. And you have that paper record for 22 months. Yes, <laughs> yes we do. Um, and then one other thing to bring up, just kind of on the same subject, you can register to vote by absentee for the same purposes of getting an absentee ballot. So if you're really not going to be able to show up in person on election day to do the same day voter registration, but you want to participate and vote by absentee, we check our checklist. If we see that you're not listed on that checklist, we're going to send you a packet with detailed instructions on how to get registered to vote, and everything comes back with the ballot. And follow we try to get everybody. <laughs> follow them carefully. 
So we have 15 minutes. We can do a quickie tour if everybody wants to see.